morning, everybody. I wanted to get your attention for just a minute. I'm the very Reverend Ray Walden. I am the Dean and the Rector of the Cathedral Church of St. Mark. We are the second oldest church in continuous use in the state of Utah, and we are delighted that you are here. I think it is important that St. Mark's continue the tradition that we've had for generations of welcoming all faiths into our hall and into our home. I think dialogue is such an important part of what we as Episcopalians, Christians, and other faiths do, and we do it extremely well here in Salt Lake City. I wanted to give you the schedule of what is going on today. Currently, you've already figured out lunch. So good for you, you've got that. At 12 noon, we will begin the ladies' talk on trees and spirituality. And at 12.30, it is a beautiful day. I wish I could take credit for this, but I'm in sales, not management. But it's a beautiful day that we have outside for you to walk on our campus and toward the trees. I want to tell you a little bit about uh, Dr. Ned Carney. It's great to have her here. She's been here for six months from Evergreen uh, in Washington State. She is also at the University of the U as a professor of biology and director of the Center for Science and Mathematics Education. And for nine months you've been here, nine months in Utah. So it's great having you here. She's interested, though, in public outreach of science of all kinds. And what she has done is create something that is unique. I think you'll find her presentation extremely well received. And to start off with over 90 people registered for this on a Tuesday is fantastic. Would you please join me in a warm welcome for Dr. Nalini. Dr. Thank you very much, Reverend, and thanks for coming today, this afternoon. Um, I'm really delighted to be here. It's kind of funny to be a scientist, uh, where I usually am out on a field site in Costa Rica or Washington State or in my own laboratories at the university, but instead to find myself here at this, at this beautiful place of worship um, to talk about trees and spirituality. And my talk will be in just a few minutes, but I wanted to thank a few people, um, the, the Reverend himself, for opening his doors to this talk. Um, secondly, I'd like to thank Emily Gaines, who's done a lot of work. She is at the Center for Science and Math Education at the University, in terms of the logistics of pulling this together. And thirdly, I'd like to thank uh, Susan Soleil, who is the head of uh, Utah Interfaith Power and Light, a local organization um, that brings together churches of all kinds uh, to help think about and raise awareness of global climate change. And Susan is here right now. She helped organize and make contact with your with this church here. If you could just say a couple words, that would be great. And as she's moving up, I just wanted to say that um, we're very happy to have recycling here as well. I think that blends in with Susan's message. Um, so back in the back over there on my left, there's a place you can put your plastic containers when you're done with your delicious lunch. Susan. Welcome, we are so happy to have you here. Can I just see a show of hands? How many of you are here from either the Utah Interfaith Power and Light community or the Salt Lake Interfaith Power and Light community? Okay, and then how many from the University of Utah community? Lovely, that's really wonderful. And how many just because you heard it from some, for, oh, wow, that's excellent. I love how word spreads about events like this. So Utah Interfaith Power and Light is an organization that works with all faith communities we try not to use churches because we have synagogues and mosques um, that are wanting to be more energy efficient, more aware of their carbon footprint, not only as a, a faith community, but also at home. So we have on the table a sign-up sheet. We have an amazing e-newsletter that comes out that has all kinds of information about how to be more energy efficient, local events, national events, things that are going on that are very um, timely, and if you'd like to be part of that, please sign up and give us your email. We promise we will not sell you anything. So. Thank you for being here. Uh, we're in for a treat. I met Malini about six, seven months ago, and we've been trying to figure out how to coordinate all of her wealth of information and get it out to this kind of group, and this is a perfect setting. Thank you, Reverend, for making this happen. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, Malini. So our time 
together is fairly short. We just have about a little over an hour. Um, but what the program is is for you all to enjoy lunch, to break bread together, um, and then to move yourselves over from the round tables to these chairs here. You'll see there's a handout here. So when you're done with your lunch, if you could come forward and fill up these chairs. Um, I'll be speaking from 12 to about 12.30. We'll have some time for questions and discussion. And then we'll take the opportunity, as the Reverend said, of taking advantage of this beautiful day. Um, we'll be handing out little pamphlets that contain information about the trees that live and are spending their lives here in the churchyard of this Episcopal church. One of my students put this, whole, uh, this pamphlet together. We put in um, all kinds of biological and spiritual information and religious information about the particular trees that are supported and hosted here in the sacred grounds of your churchyards. Um, and so we'll have an opportunity, if you wish, to look around at these trees, to talk about them with each other, and figure out um, what kind of trees are you're, you're preserving and maintaining here. So if you could take just the next few minutes to finish up your lunch and then move forward into the chairs, I'll start in about seven or eight minutes. Thanks. Need to take care of ourselves um, on this biosphere. I thought I would give a little bit of background about myself. As the Reverend mentioned, I'm a neuropsychologist. I teach and carry out research at the University of Utah, and I carry out research mostly in Monterrey, Costa Rica, where I'm sitting right here in Washington State. I thought I'd give a little bit of my own religious background because this is also about religion and spirituality. I'd like to introduce you to my parents. Uh, these, this is my mom and dad. My father was a Hindu. He came from India to study uh, pharmacology. Uh, he was a tall, quiet man who was uh, very much a scientist. Um, and my mother, from Brooklyn, New York, was raised as a Orthodox Jew. Uh, she was very bubbly and ebullient. And so the two of them really, for myself, my sisters, and my brothers, really kind of set in ourselves very early in life, from birth really, the knowledge, the understanding, and the appreciation that really all religions are essentially the same. Hindu and a Jew living together, having children and a family together, um, surely means that uh, religions in general might be able to find on the common ground. Uh, this was me as a little kid. I loved to climb trees, even as a very small girl. And when I climbed trees in Bethesda, Maryland, where I grew up, I never imagined that I would be able to do that for a living uh, 50 years later. But as it turns out, that has been um, what I've been trying to do. And the part of the trees and the forest that I'm most interested in is the forest canopy that part of the forest that's high above the forest floor that's been very little explored because of our lack of ability to climb into trees. Um, and it's actually been called the last biotic frontier. So this part of the forest, as all parts of the forest really, is a place full of mystery, a place ripe for discovery, a place that we want to come to understand. And the tools that I've used as a scientist to come to understand that canopy involve mountain climbing techniques, they use construction cranes, we use hot air balloons, to get up to this last biotic frontier. And we have learned a great deal about the animals and the plants that live in the forest canopy in tropical and temperate regions. These plants that live in the canopy are called epiphytes. They're very important in nutrient cycling. The animals that have adapted themselves, um, like prehensile tails, are also very interesting. And the ecological functions or processes, for instance, bird pollination, are also occurring in the forest, uh, the forest canopy. Over the last 30 or so years, as, as people have entered into the forest canopy, we've learned that forest canopy organisms help to maintain biodiversity, they enhance nutrient cycles, and they really help to stay, stabilize world climate because of the amount of carbon that's held within their leaves, their stems, their branches, and their trunks. So in the last 30 years, scientists have come to understand that there are ecological values in this unknown part of the forest that we never knew before. Unfortunately, at the same time we're learning about these ecological values of forest canopies, we're also coming to understand that they're being destroyed by human activities, by deforestation, by mining, by global climate change, uh, by over-harvesting. And as a scientist, and one who loves being in the forest, loves climbing trees, those problems are not only the problems of the deforestation themselves, but there's an accompanying sense of the increasing distance between humans and trees, humans and nature in general. And it was these issues, these problems, that began getting me to think, as a scientist and as a human being, what can I do to help raise awareness and carry out some sort of change that would reverse or slow the trend that we're seeing in terms of the loss of forest canopy organisms and the distancing of humans to nature. 
Well, it seemed to me that I might be able to communicate what I knew, not only to scientists, but also to other people, people who might not necessarily be interested in National Geographic films or, or going out to the field themselves. And it seemed that perhaps one of, those pe one of those sets of people might be people who have a strong faith, a strong sense of religion. And so I set about in the last few years to try to understand um, how religion and spirituality on the one hand might intersect with forest ecology and forest conservation on the other hand. And I think that, um, you know, obviously religion is a very strong force in the human race of the seven billion people on earth. Over 80% of them believe in some kind of religion or religious practice. So that is a lot of people that we might be communicating with. Um, and trees, it seems to me, are inherently spiritual. Hermann Hesse, the wonderful German poet and, and writer, wrote that in, trees, in the tree's highest boughs, the world rustles, their roots rest in infinity. Nothing is holier, nothing is more exemplary than a beautiful, strong tree. I just want to, before going further, I just want to make a little point about the two words, religion and spirituality, that I consider them similar or, or complementary, but not necessarily entirely overlapping. Religion is defined as a set of beliefs about the divine that its followers hold to answer questions of origin, purpose, morality, and mortality. And spirituality, and this is a definition from the Dalai Lama, guides people about contentment, timelessness, right and wrong, self-discipline, change, connection, peace, sharing, forgiveness, and tolerance. So of course there's lots of overlap, but there's also areas of difference. The way that I've set up this talk is to address three questions that you will take with you as you go, I hope, and think further than what I've been able to give you in the brief time we have together. First, how do trees, how do trees participate in the world of religion and spirituality? Second, how might awareness of this participation lead us to be better stewards of our trees and by extension of nature? And third, most general, how might we bring the two ways of knowing, of science and of religion and spirituality, to provide greater depth and dimensionality to our understanding of humans' connections with nature? So let's take the first question. How do trees participate in spirituality in different religious and spiritual traditions. When I began thinking about this question, I thought that perhaps the best way to get at this would be to start reading the religious texts, the holy writings of each religion, and to look for the places where they've written about trees or forests. And I started with the Old Testament, because that's sort of a basic text for the Judeo-Christian tradition, which is dominant here. And I started reading the Bible and then downloaded the Old Testament from the web and did a search for the word tree and forest. And I found that there were actually 328 references to these two words. And being a scientist, of course, I had to categorize which of these verses belong to which category. So I'll just go through this and give you a couple of examples. Probably many of these are familiar to you. Uh, for instance, there were about 30% of those verses that had to do with um, symbolic and aesthetic use. For instance, in 2 Chronicles, uh, we read, he offered sacrifices and burned incense at the high places on the hilltops and under every spreading tree. So tree being a symbolic use here. Aesthetic use um, applies to, uh, like for instance, temple decorations. In Genesis 2 we read, on the walls all around the temple in both the inner and outer rooms, he carved cherubim palm trees and open flowers. So trees are obviously important in terms of the aesthetics of the people who believe in the Bible. In terms of analogies to God, this is one of my favorite uses of, of tree analogies. In the Song of Solomon, you might remember that is written, like an apple tree among the trees, is uh, trees of the forest, is my lover among the young men. I delight to sit in his shade, and his fruit is sweet to my taste. So using an apple as a, and a tree as an analogy to something very important. The Bible is full of uh, use of trees and their products for human food. In Genesis again, then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food. So the most basic use of trees being our food. Location descriptions are very important. So Abraham moved his tents and went to live near the great trees of Mamre at Hebron, where he built an, an altar to the Lord. So finding place, having a sense of location, are attributed to trees, and trees are used for this very important function. 
We also see that there are some references of tree loss being bad. In Deuteronomy 20, it is written, when you lay siege to a city for a long time, fighting against it to capture it, do not destroy its trees by putting an axe to it. An axe to it. Do not cut them down. So for even for someone's worst enemy, we don't dare cut down trees um, uh, and, and cause that great damage. <clears throat> and finally, there were a few references to tree biology of trees living near water courses. Well, I shared these results with some of the congregations in Olympia, Washington, where I lived, and I got great feedback, and it encouraged me to pursue this in other world religions. So, for example, when I first came here to Utah, I looked at the Book of Mormon, and I found that there were 103 verses that relate to trees. I'll give you the one that I like best that was in one uh, Nephi. And it came to pass, after I had seen the tree, I said unto the Spirit, I behold, thou hast shown unto me the tree which is precious above all. So there's a sense of connection and preciousness um, in the Holy Book of Mor the Mormon religion. As I went further through these texts, I came up with a number of um, sort of generalities that I'd like to share with you. There are actually six of them. That is, six patterns that I found in terms of the relationship of trees and spirituality by looking at these different world religions. The first one is about form and function. That the form and function of a tree literally embodies spirituality in the way that they connect things to our cosmos. This connection between earth and sky is something that I think um, represents a truly spiritualistic idea. This is actually a very old idea that predated the Christian religion, the idea of what is called the axis mundi, the central staff or pillar that connects the underworld with the middle world with the upper world. And this object might be a mountain or a vine or a stalk or a column of smoke, but most frequently it is portrayed as a, as a tree. And in the Norse religion, there was a giant ash tree called Yggdrasil, and that was the axis that connected all these parts of our universe. In terms of our own, uh, a sort of another facet, another category of trees and spirituality, is that trees are seen as miraculous manifestations of divine knowledge having power to bestow and renew life, connecting humans with the divine. So of course, uh, as we know in Genesis, in the second chapter of Genesis, we know that trees uh, manifest the divine knowledge. And this is the quote, and the Lord God planted a garden in Eden, and out of the ground the Lord God made to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And of those, those, of course, become extremely important religious symbols, uh, both in religion and literature and in the way we lead our lives. In the Hindu religion, there's a plant called the Tulsi tree, um, and that is a tree that signifies the connection between the divine or the world of the gods and the world of humans. This um, is a shrub that grows in every, human, in every Hindu house in a little cement urn in the yard. The flowering signifies the beginning of the wedding season, and Hindus recount the myth of the god Krishna, the god you might know as being blue, um, descending to earth to marry the Tulsi tree, thus symbolizing this connection between gods and the earth. A third category I'd like to touch on is trees and the link to truth and enlightenment. We saw that religion and spirituality both have something to do with finding truth, just as science does and explaining the way the world works. Actually, when you look at the word, the old English word for the word tree, you get the word trough, which is very related to the word truth. And so this idea of, if you think of somebody speaking the truth, you want to look for something with a, st a strong trunk, something that has deep roots, and something that sweeps the sky. And that is what you will see, a tree full of truth in terms of its form. Trees also remind us physically of the connection between heaven and earth. Rabindranath Tagore, the Indian poet, the Hindu poet, stated that trees are the earth's endless heavens to speak to the listening, the earth's endless efforts to speak to the listening heavens. And indeed, we see this when we look at um, cathedrals. Gothic architecture has been considered sort of the height of Western architecture. And when you think of going into a cathedral, your eyes go up. It follows the line of the, of the columns up and into the heavens, just as we see when we go into a forest. And the trunks grab our eyes, and they take us heavenward also. So that's a real connection that we can see architecturally. 
Another connection between trees and truth or enlightenment is through the teachings of Buddha. And Buddha was a prince. He was born a prince. Um, he wanted to understand how to get rid of the earth's sufferings that he saw everywhere. He found a bow tree, the Bodhi tree. It's the ficus religiosa, a fig tree. He sat underneath it for three days. And after three days, when he woke up, he became the enlightened one. And he spread his teachings of peace and compassion across all of Asia. Indeed, trees are everywhere, and that sense of spirituality and of seeing the name of God is everywhere. And in the religion of Islam, one of the things that's very important is the word, the, the actual character of the name Allah. And Allah can be seen in trees. In fact, if you go to the web and you Google uh, Islam trees and Allah, what you'll find is a series, a long series of photographs that people have posted that look like the name Allah. And you can see that there on the, on the, in the green and, and yellow, that actually they see God literally in the branches, the form of the branches also. So this reminder of the presence of a Holy Spirit uh, is with us everywhere if you simply look for it. I think another piece of this has to do with truthfulness, and that is to seeing the whole tree seeing the whole person, seeing the whole community, seeing our whole biosphere. And that's about finding truth, which is, again, what both science and religion have to offer. Um, we know that we often show our good parts, just as a tree shows its above ground leaves and fruits and flowers. But we also know that trees have below ground parts, their root systems, that are equally important because they are the mechanisms by which water and nutrients make their way into trees. Well, human beings also have their below ground parts, their weaknesses, their fears, their addictions, their problems. And we often, in not being truthful, try to hide those. But we also know that when we look at a tree and see the strength that the roots give to the above ground parts, that it's important to share those underground parts to ourselves, to our pastors, to our friends, and to our family. So in that way, we can look at a tree and be reminded of the spiritual lesson, which is that we must be aware and accepting of those parts that we try to keep underground. Trees and breathing. This is a fabulously important spiritual and physical and ecological piece of, of what trees and spirituality are apart to me. We all know that trees are photosynthetic. Through this amazing process of photosynthesis, trees take in carbon dioxide through the pores of their leaves. They go through biochemical reactions, and they exude oxygen. And so in that way, they are replenishing the planet for other beings like ourselves who need to take in oxygen and breathe out carbon dioxide and ourselves then replenish the air for trees and other plants. Uh, so trees are breathing entities, and we are breathing entities too. And in fact, when we look at our mechanisms of breathing in our own bodies, our lungs, of course, which bring in air, and the heart, which circulates oxygen around our body, we can also see, if we squinch our eyes just a little bit, the fact that these are a tree uh, dendritic uh, structure as well. So I love this to look at this picture and realize that not only are trees in my heart, but they're also in my heart. And I think that's really interesting. <laughs> Another um, aspect of this that is related to breathing is about silence. The fact that trees have no sound-making mechanism themselves means that, at least for me, silence and stillness are really a part of what being a tree is. And this, to my mind, regard, um, recalls the, the, the practice of Buddhism called samatha. That is, samatha meditation is a way of using the breath to train the mind to find stillness in this busy world of ours. And actually, I think this is true not only of spirituality, but also of religion. I know that when I have attended church services, as I did last Sunday here at St. Mark's, one of the things I noticed was that it was the, the tiny, quiet moments in the Reverend's sermon, the moving from standing to sitting, or sitting to kneeling, and then kneeling to sitting again, where there was a moment there to contemplate, to be reflective, and to feel connected to the rest of the congregation. And I think that's very important. Related to uh, silence is uh, the idea of trees and oneness. And this, again, is a very spiritual idea. Another aspect of Buddhism is that the idea that we have that, that I am separate from you and this floor is separate from the ceiling is an illusion, that all of these are one. In fact, Buddha wrote, we are all the same as plants, as trees, as other people, as the rain that falls. We consist of that all around us. We are the same as everything.
And I really love to think about this because I know when I go out and climb trees, the big leaf maple trees in the Olympic rainforest, which are covered with mosses and which are populated by these amazing ferns, they're called licorice ferns, uh, Polypodium glyceriza. Um, if I start looking at them, I see them and counting them as individual fern fronds. But when I actually follow their stems, I see they're connected to a root. And when I, when I follow that root to the next stem, I see that the next stem is connected by that root to the first stem. And I go on to the third and the fourth and the tenth and the twentieth. And I realize then that all of these individual fronds are in fact connected to each other, to one another, and connected in other ways to the nutrient cycles of the forest as a whole. And although we don't have these ferns and mosses here in Utah, you can just go up into the hills here and find aspen trees for which is the same lesson is told, that we are one thing. Another aspect of this is that trees are related to time. Remember the Dalai Lama told us that spirituality was about timelessness and time. And I think that trees help humans tell time. And they spell the seasons, like the fall colors, um, that tell us that indeed fall has arrived, summer is over, and winter is coming on. Nothing more effectively indicates the seasons than this changing of colors of the leaves of autumns, or the tender green, little green leaves that come out of buds in the spring, or the fall of leaves during the winter. In fact, Herman Hesse, again, wrote that nothing is holier, nothing is more exemplary than a beautiful, strong tree. When a tree is cut down and reveals its naked death wound to the sun, one can read its whole history in the luminous inscribed disc of its trunk, in the rings of its years, its scars, all the struggle, all the suffering, all the sickness, all the happiness and prosperity stand truly written, the narrow years and the luxurious years, the attacks withstood, the storms endured. And this bristlecone pine from our own state of Utah that can live for nearly 4,000 years old and endure these stor storms and happinesses uh, that Hesse describes, I think, tell us more than any human being can of how we need to think about uh, withstanding time and rejoicing both in its ephemerality and its length. Well, all of these different ideas of relating trees to spirituality leads us to considering ideas about how to protect them, how to keep them going on our biosphere, how to conserve them. And so now I'd like to address my second question of how might awareness of the presence of trees in spirituality and religion lead us to be better stewards of trees, better keepers of our forests? There are many ways by which this can be done, and I think although there's a lot of discouraging news going on about trees, I think there's a lot of hope as well. And one thing I'd like you to know about is that um, religions, although um, they have often been sort of purveyors of destruction or overconsumption or um, just sort of societal goings on that have contributed to some of the negative things happening to trees. We know that religions have also been at the forefront of reforms, of labor reforms, of immigration reforms, of justice for the poor and oppressed. And I know that's especially true of the Episcopal Church. And so I think what we're seeing now in a very hopeful way is that religion is trying to de develop a sense of ethics, ethics of reverence, of respect, of restraint, of redistribution and responsibility to our trees and other natural resources. And there's a group I just wanted to make sure you're aware of called the Forum on Religion and Ecology uh, out of Yale University School of Forestry and also the Yale School of Divinity. Um, G. Evelyn Tucker and John Grimm are the ones who are uh, running this, but they are really trying to understand what the connections are between religion today and the conservation today. And they have a lot of great resources on their website, so I thought I would share that with you. Oh, sorry. It is um, HTTP, I think it's F-O-R-E dot research dot Yale dot E-D-U. I can give that to you after. I'm sorry some of these slides are a little bit cut off. But the tradition of religion and stewardship, the tradition of spirituality and environmentalism goes way back when God told Adam that he needed to name and take care and be a good steward of the beasts of the land. When St. Francis showed us that it was a virtue to take care of animals and other creatures on our earth. This is not only true of the Christian religion, but also it goes way back in terms of the, uh, the Judaic tradition. Um, in the Talmud we can read, And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden, and so you too, when you come to Israel, shall do nothing before you have planted. 
So planting trees has been very important. And in fact, Jews celebrate the holiday Tum Shabbat, usually in the beginning of January, which is called the New Year for the Trees. It started as a secular holiday for taxing of fruit trees, but has since turned into a wonderful celebration of the kinds of gifts that trees provide for humans and has now turned into an opportunity to give trees, uh, to plant trees in their own community, and also to give money to plant trees in Israel. In terms of the Hindu religion, the sacred groves of India are now really protecting the last remaining bits and pieces of that biodiversity that exist in that populous country. From ancient times, there were certain groves, certain parts of forests that were held as the places where the gods lived, and therefore they were protected from being cut down for anything. Um, and so now they exist, as I said, to protect a huge number of species that are found nowhere else on Earth. I'll also say that there are a number of groups that have taken action to save and conserve trees. Some of these are related to uh, churches. Others are independent. And I'm sure you're familiar with many of them, the Nature Conservancy, World Wildlife Fund. And I do want to reiterate that Utah Interfaith Power and Light, which, by the way, is a national group and has national po uh, promise or prominence, um, has taken a huge stride in terms of bringing together not only different, but not only church, a church and, and uh, a growing awareness of global climate change, but also bringing churches together. It is definitely an interfaith group. And so that's a group I think that if you have a desire to pursue this, would be a great way to continue with that. So all of these patterns I've mentioned that are created by texts, by symbols, by rituals, by celebrations of world religions, trees have many symbolic connections to human spirituality and religions. Connecting worlds, linking enlightenment, creating a sense of oneness, connecting to breathing, and a sense of time and unity that, uh, that I think are very important in terms of how we view trees and how we have to come to understand not only their ecological value, but their spiritual value. The last thing I'd like to talk about with this, with this third question I mentioned is how might we bring these two ways of knowing, these two lenses of science and of spirituality and religion to provide greater depth and dimensionality to our understanding of humans' relationships to nature. And I have to say that there's a lot of empty space there that I don't have a nice pat answer for you uh, to, to respond to the very question that I have myself posed to you. I think this desire to understand how the ways of knowing of science and religion might come together or might complement each other is a challenge that all of us can start thinking about and talking about and perhaps taking action about. Um, and maybe some of that can be discussed after I finish talking or when we finish going through the churchyard or when you're home with your family or friends, that this idea of science and religion is being seemingly so very far apart from each other. When we consider this idea of understanding those connections of trees and by extension nature. Uh, to ourselves and to each other as this world, uh, science and religion are not so very far apart. Well, there is a desire to take action on the part of many of us, um, and I am no different. And I began to think about the concrete ways, besides just talking about the stuff or sitting and reading the Quran and the Bible and, and laughing on and on about it, is that maybe I need to do something concrete. And so with my staff and my peers at the, um, at the University of Utah, we've started a program where we're trying to develop projects that would raise awareness of the ecological importance of trees and nature to other people, and also to learn from them what information, what senses, what emotions, and what ideas might come from religion to augment what we know in science. One of the things, one of the projects that we're now working on is to make these handbooks for missionaries. Many of our young folk uh, go off on missions to other parts of the world. So this is a handbook of natural history of different countries where a missionary might go. This one is from Costa Rica. So a young missionary going to Costa Rica would be able to find out what are the 10 common birds in Costa Rica? What are the 10 common trees? And to share that with people that they start having a relationship with, that this might be a way to initiate a conversation or continue a conversation that might not have anything at first to do about religion. But again, harkening back to this coming together of ecology and religion might have everything to do with religion and understanding the world. We've also made one for Utah so that we can make sure that they bring information about our natural history to wherever they might go on their missions. Uh, we also had an idea um, that would relate to this of helping to understand and ourselves coming to understand the importance 
ecological and spiritual and religious importance of trees and other biota that actually live on the holy ground of churches themselves and other places of worship. Um, that is, we often think when we enter a church, I know whenever I enter whatever church I'm entering, I feel this sense of, oh my gosh, I'm in this holy place. I'm in a place full of reverence and traditions um, and beliefs that are, are sacred. Um, and so I think sometimes there's an overlooking of the grounds, an overlooking of the plants and animals that use the church just as we do uh, for, for whatever it is for their lives. And so um, I had a wonderful student named Kate Peterson who came down from the Evergreen State College uh, last semester, and she and I mapped all the trees on the church ground of this church, and then we found out uh, the names of these trees, and some interesting aspect of their biology or their significance in the Bible or some other holy scripture. So we've made these little booklets, and I think Emily is going to give them out to you as we as we walk out the door. Um, we'll have the opportunity, if you wish, to follow me around and just sort of check out the booklet. But we feel it's a way to extend the sense of reverence and of holiness beyond the bricks and mortar of the things that we humans build to those entities which are living and alive and which need our care. So, I'd like to leave you with a last thought, again from Herman Hesse, about trees, and about spirituality, and about happiness. So the tree rustles in the evening when we stand uneasy before our own childish thoughts. Trees have longer thoughts, long breathing and restful, just as they have longer lives than ours. When we have learned how to listen to trees, then the brevity, and the quickness, and the childlike hastiness of our thoughts achieve an incomparable joy. Whoever has learned how to listen to trees no longer wants to be a tree. He wants to be nothing except what he is. That is home. That is happiness. Thank you.